Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are still boarding, but uh, uh, people are starting to trickle in, and we are delighted to uh, start this round as, as we speak. Uh, my name is Tyson Barker, and I'm the Deputy Director at the Aspen Institute Germany, and I run our tech program and our transatlantic program. And I am really delighted to have you all here for this book launch uh, with Susan Glasser for her new book, which is, uh, it's a German language book. It's actually a compendium of uh, essays that she's written called Briefe aus Trump's Washington, Letters from Trump's Washington, which is a, a weekly series that she does for the New Yorker. Uh, we are gonna have a great on the record conversation today. Um, um, but before I introduce uh, Susan and we start to jump into the fun, I just wanna put up some, uh, some housekeeping and ground rules. I think everybody here on this call is pretty fluent in Zoom at this point, but uh, just to kind of go through some of the rules, we're going to have a conversation between the two of us, and then we're going to open it up for questions, comments uh, from all of you. We want this to be interactive. So if you have a question or comment, you can either write it down in the, the Q&A function, or, and this is what I would prefer, you can uh, raise your digital hand on the side, and we'll make sure to call on you. Please identify yourself as well and, uh, and uh, you know, name and affiliation. If you are calling in, if you're using a regular phone, you hit star nine and we'll be able to get to you as well. Uh, as I mentioned, this conversation is on the record. Um, we are actually streaming this on Facebook and it will be available later on YouTube. So those are the, the housekeeping. And with that, let's get into it. So I am delighted to have this conversation today with Susan Glasser who is a staff writer for The New Yorker, where she writes this weekly column, uh, which has been made into this German language compendium. Uh, Glasser has served as the top editor of several Washington publications, uh, most recently at Politico Magazine, where she was the founder and was the editor of Politico throughout the 2016 election cycle. So I'm sure she got no sleep um, and probably is still trying to recover. I mean, probably very triggering going into 2020. Uh, prior to that, she was the Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy and has worked uh, in, in numerous publications in Washington, including uh, the Washington Post, where she oversaw coverage of the impeachment of Bill Clinton. So uh, has experienced two impeachments in her Washington life at this point. She is also the author, in addition to this compendium, of a book, uh, Kremlin Rising, uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia and the End of the Re uh, the End of Revolution, which she co-authored with her husband, Peter Baker. And she has also uh, published a biography, I think it just came out, uh, of uh, former Secretary of State uh, James Baker, who is, of course, a great friend of Germany uh, and, and well-remembered here in Berlin. So thank you so much for being here with us, Susan. And uh, we are delighted to have this book and feature it. It's a publication of Welt Kiosk, which is an independent publishing house founded by two of our friends here at Aspen, Germany, uh, Alexander Steff Alexandra Steffes and Henning Hof, uh, which was originally founded in London, but has been in Berlin for the past couple of years. So with that, let's get into the conversation. Um, I think this is going to be a very anthropological conversation. We were just talking about the book, which I have had the honor to read over the past week. And, you know, the interesting thing is, even though everybody talks about Trump, Trump isn't really the star of these articles. Um, it's more a, a, a book of manners, uh, how different actors, how different institutions, how different players are reacting to Trump. If they're accommodating Trump, if they're putting themselves in the resistance, how they're dealing with many of the moral questions, the political questions that he throws up. So uh, just to start us out, Susan, um, can you give us a topography of Trump's Washington as you see it in these past three years? How has it evolved and where are we at now? Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, to you and to the Aspen Institute for having me. Uh, I'm delighted that this uh, German language edition of my columns has come out. It does seem uh, timely, although of course every day there's new material <laughs> uh, that has yet to, to make it in there. Uh, we're all watching this unfold in real time, but I, you know, I like very much your observation about the sort of anthropological nature of the exercise of observing what happens when a force as disruptive and unconventional uh, and determined in fact to uh, you know sort of be a demolition artist uh, as Donald Trump 
comes to a place like Washington, uh, which uh, prides itself on traditions, institutions, uh, like all capital cities, uh, whether Berlin or London uh, or Paris, it uh, has its uh, uh, characters, uh, who are fixtures of the uh, establishment over decades. These are people who are adept at accommodating themselves to power, uh, right? That's the nature of any capital city. Uh, and uh, of course, what happens when the power simply just won't let you conform? Uh, it, it reminds me, in fact, your comment of a conversation I had with uh, a very veteran US diplomat early on in uh, the Trump administration. Uh, talking about his attacks on the State Department. As you know, uh, he's no big uh, fan of American diplomats, especially those who deal with Germany, uh, and um, you know, made attacks on uh, the what he called the Deep State Department recently, uh, a feature of his administration from, from day one. And you know, this diplomat was observing to me what a mistake it was in saying you know, that he simply doesn't understand the State Department. Uh, you know, they're, they're like, dogs with a new master. It's not in their DNA uh, to bite uh, the master, but simply to figure out what, what uh, he or she wants. And Donald Trump sort of skipped that step and uh, never understood that it literally was in the DNA of uh, these officials to do what he wanted. Uh, he didn't make it possible for them to do what he wanted. And I think that's, a, to me, a metaphor for uh, the entire Trump presidency so far as it comes to the institutions of Washington. These are people who by and large are desperate uh, to please the power, to accommodate to the power, and yet have found themselves for varying reasons uh, unable at various points to do so. The demands made by the president at some point seem to cross every line uh, that these folks make for themselves. And of course, today, I'm speaking to you on a day in Washington when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has just issued a remarkable apology and essentially said, Donald Trump made me go too far. And you'll recall, it was just uh, 10 days ago when uh, the Trump uh, administration, the Attorney General ordered the violent clearing uh, uh, by troops of the square in front of the White House in order for Trump to stage a photo op. And he brought with him to that photo op, uh, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, dressed in combat fatigues. Donald Trump knew exactly what he was doing. This was the photo op that he craved. He wanted uh, to flank himself in the full uh, regalia of American military power. And it was a shameful moment, truthfully, a shocking moment. I was watching it live, as I'm sure many people were on television when uh, uh, General Milley in fatigues is walking beside Trump. And I, I, I gasped and you know, said to my husband and son with whom I was watching this moment, you know, this is unbelievable uh, that, that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs would allow himself to be used in this way. And of course, over the last 10 days, there's been a lot of agony uh, between the military and Trump and now Milley has apologized to it. So you know, forgive the, the long-winded anecdote, but I think it illustrates your point that in many ways, the story of the Trump presidency is not some radical change in Donald Trump, the man. Uh, in fact, he is a kind of complex and disturbing psychological character, but actually fairly transparent in his obsessions and neuroses and um, uh, uh, the problems that he inflicts on others. But it's, it's what other people do or don't do that has been very fascinating to me as, as an observer and as a journalist. Let's, let's start with that institution, that actor, which you mentioned, which is the Pentagon. Obviously, there are a lot of different voices at the Pentagon, but they have been really under the limelight, under a lot of scrutiny because of the actions uh, taken, uh, clearing out that square in front of the church, because of the dis debate around the Insurrection Act. Um, recently, uh, obviously, this is getting kind of caught up in the in the, the thrush, in the churn of the debate around um, George Floyd, renaming bases uh, that were named for Confederate generals, including major bases like Fort Bragg. Uh, how is the Pentagon and its uh, the keep its gatekeepers, its deep its deepest individuals, the people who are really there to protect the institution, how are they responding to all this pressure? Well, interestingly enough, they, uh, you know, in fits and starts, right, it took, took him a number of days, but they are pushing back. 
uh, in a way that I have not seen before. And that's why you'll hear commentators calling this the gravest civil military crisis, uh, you know, in recent memory. Uh, and, you know, this has a long thread going back really to the beginning of the Trump administration. Uh, I write about this uh, in some of the columns that are collected in the book, but, uh, you know, Donald Trump has always had an obsession with the military uh, and, you know, it goes along with his um, view of himself as a tough guy, uh, a worshiper of strength, or what he believes to be strength. Uh, G general Patton is one of his heroes, the World War II general, and in fact, uh, uh, not really, he's not a student of history or anything. He, what he means is the movie version mm. uh, of Patton, uh, which is uh, one of, if not his favorite movie, and that seems to have been a, a major reason why Donald Trump picked Jim Mattis to be his first defense secretary, uh, because it, he was seen as the toughest of tough guys. Uh, Trump appears to have been told that Mattis's nickname was Mad Dog. Uh, he wasn't told that Mattis hated that nickname, <laughs> uh, and in fact was a scholar general uh, who uh, uh, was famously disciplined and ascetic and carried uh, a thousand books around with him to every post. Uh, in other words, almost the polar opposite of Donald Trump, who, by the way, was a Vietnam era draft dodger. Uh, and so this is a thread that goes all the way back to the beginning of the Trump presidency, his effort to surround himself with the military uh, and uh, sort of cover himself in its glory without actually understanding it or its traditions or uh, its, its culture of, of leadership. And so clashes were inevitable. They occurred. Uh, and um, uh, the very first column I wrote uh, for The New Yorker in this series of letters from Trump's Washington was actually about General Mattis trying uh, uh, and in that particular case, succeeding in restraining Trump in a previous um, uh, moment of conflict over what to do about Iran. Eventually, of course, General Mattis uh, resigned uh, uh, in a disagreement with Trump who demanded that he pull all US troops uh, out of Syria and, uh, weeks after Mattis and other US military officials had assured our allies that we would not abandon them. Uh, and, you know, so, Flash forward to this current crisis that we're having now, uh, and you have Mattis, who, while he resigned in protest, has basically remained silent, which is the other amazing thing from an anthropological point of view. Many of these people have fallen out with Trump. He's had higher turnover than any uh, administration at its top levels in modern memory, and yet, uh, you know, these people, by and large, have not publicly attack him, have largely chosen to remain silent, have, have feared for whatever reasons uh, the tweets and the public attacks that Trump would lodge against them. Mattis a few months ago published a book and said yet he had a duty of silence to Trump while he remained president. So in this current crisis, he deemed it so serious that he actually came out with a public statement attacking Trump saying it was a violation of the constitutional rights of uh, the protesters and that it was essentially un-American to sick the United States military on its own people. Uh, and uh, that's the backdrop for this very dramatic moment we're having in Washington right now. Yeah, I mean, I remember he said in an interview he would speak out when the time was right. And what struck me in that statement was he said when the time was right. And it almost seemed inevitable that there would be a time. I mean, you can maybe I'm reading too much into that. But um, you mentioned troop withdrawal from northern Syria, the or the announcement from Syria that led to Mattis's resignation. He mentioned in his resignation letter the importance of allies. Um, yet, uh, just this week, we have another announcement of troop withdrawals, and that's from this country, Germany, uh, four thousand or excuse me, nine thousand seven hundred troops. Uh, what should we make of this? Is this going to happen? Is this bluster? And what are the kind of motivating factors that are, are behind that decision or that announcement? Well, uh, you know, another through line of the Trump presidency, of course, has been his uh, remarkable disdain for and uh, habit of aggressively challenging uh, uh, U.S. allies in Europe and in the European Union, and in particular, of course, Germany. And this is something uh, from the very first day of his presidency, Trump has been personally intent upon, uh, despite the fact that uh, really no one in his party or uh, in the Democratic Party supports this. It seems to be a policy of one. Uh, and he's taken a particular animus, as I wrote about in another one of the pieces in the book, uh, to German Chancellor Angela Merkel. And again, that forms the backdrop 
of uh, this decision is something, by the way, my sources have told me Trump has talked about for a long time. Uh, you know, so far his advisors have been able to constrain him or to steer him away from actually taking this step, uh, which he has threatened to do before. Uh, but again, in this current moment, it's, it's not gotten as much coverage here in Washington because of the extraordinary national unrest over George Floyd killing, the pandemic, the economic crisis. Uh, uh, but in the midst of all of this, Trump seems to have had a very, very contentious phone call with Angela Merkel, uh, uh, not this past week, but the week before, uh, in which she refused his uh, invitation to come to Washington for an in-person G7 summit, which he hoped to hold uh, in June as a way of uh, furthering his political message to the American people that the pandemic is over, even though it's not over, uh, and that normal uh, business uh, was resuming. And she clearly did not want to be part of a politicized photo op in Washington. There are also substantive disputes ongoing with Germany, not only over NATO, but uh, Trump has become quite obsessed with uh, the uh, Russian Gazprom pipeline Nord Stream 2 and, uh, you know, continues to raise that as a major irritant in the U.S.-German relationship. Uh, now, there are some reports, uh, as you know, that it was actually Trump's uh, initial ambassador to Germany, Rick Grinnell, who has just left the position after serving temporarily as the U.S. Director of Intelligence, that he himself, uh, who seemed to have been appointed uh, purely to be an irritant in the U.S.-German relationship, that he was the one advocating and pushing this troop withdrawal. Uh, you know, I've seen some reporting to indicate that. Uh, we'll see as, as time unfolds uh, how that hand uh, holds up. But look, if Donald Trump wins a second term, which remains a possibility, uh, he has sagged in the polls recently, uh, but not definitively. Uh, if Trump wins a second term, I think uh, you are going to see uh, a serious fraying in the relations with Germany and with NATO and with the EU that goes beyond the polarizing rhetoric of Trump's first term and may lead to uh, more long lasting and structural rifts. So let's 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 ask right, so these troops are not going to necessarily disappear in the five months between now and the U.S. election. Uh, we know that the Pentagon is pretty good at, uh, uh, you know, delaying and steamrolling policies that it doesn't like. Also, you have Republicans on Capitol Hill, uh, uh, including, I think, almost all the members of the House Armed Services Committee putting out a letter the other day saying they oppose this move. These are Republicans. Again, so they can certainly stall Donald Trump for five months. They can't stall him for four years and five months. So you, you talk about in the book, and we've seen it happen after uh, the impeachment uh, uh, in, in the House and, and acquittal in the Senate, that he felt a little untethered. Uh, he didn't feel like he was so constrained and immediately started to go after the IG, the network of oversight that exists within the government. Um, let's speculate a little bit. If he were to be reelected, uh, would he take that same kind of uh, hatchet to the institutions that bind the transatlantic relationship? Well, again, uh, you know, I do believe uh, that uh, Trump is not a kind of fully formed political ideologist. Uh, his main ideology is himself and his own self-promotion uh, and his own political survival. Uh, but he certainly has long held uh, instincts and, uh, you know, certain very, very defined views about things. And one of those things uh, is uh, Europe and Germany and NATO and the EU. And he seems to consider it uh, a rival and more of a foe or adversary uh, than many of the United States' actual military adversaries. And uh, you know, the story of his presidency over time is essentially uh, cycling through staff and advisors and cabinet secretaries to find people who will be more and more accommodating to those views. So it certainly stands to reason that were he to have a second term, he would uh, push on in the direction of distancing and rifts with NATO and the EU. Uh, and he does not have a firm rock solid commitment to any of those institutions or relationships. Uh, but again, 
What's remarkable is that Trump is running for re-election right now. And frankly, his re-election platform reminds me a lot of when I covered Vladimir Putin's first re-election to the Russian presidency back uh, in the 2000s, which is to say there is none. I can't tell you in June of 2020 what it is that Donald Trump is running on, uh, what he proposes to do in his second term. Uh, you know, even to say it's empty, empty slogans actually would be overstating it because right now he's having a crisis, uh, which is that he doesn't know which slogan <laughs> he's going to use because um, his previous slogans have been sort of rendered uh, inoperative and moot by the pandemic and the economic crisis. So genuinely, uh, he's a man without a platform uh, right now, and he is not making any real commitments to the American people. He's, he's had a remarkably substance free presidency so far when it comes to major legislation, major deals. He, he just hasn't accomplished anything and doesn't uh, want to hold himself out as saying that he will in the future do anything very specific. Perhaps just taking that point you mentioned, uh, Russia, uh, obviously we have the Mueller report, we had impeachment, uh, which you know came out of a phone call with the president of Ukraine, a discussion of a quid pro quo, um, there is a way of doing business that this White House fosters that is seen by many as unseemly, uh, unethical, and perhaps illegal. Um, if there was a rebuke in November, uh, do you see that being impetus for a new way of approaching corruption in Washington, a way of approaching corruption as a, as a national security concern, quite frankly? Uh, what do you think about that? You know, that's a, it's a very interesting issue. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost impossible until we see what happens in the election itself. I mean, your, your, your question implies that, you know, not only has Trump lost, but that his party uh, has been pushed out of the Senate uh, and essentially has been uh, sent a very, very definitive message by American voters a la Watergate uh, and the post Watergate elections, which were very, very definitive in their rebuke of the Republican party, uh, not only uh, uh, with Nixon's uh, picked successor, Gerald Ford losing uh, election in his own right to be president, but Republicans uh, being definitively uh, trounced uh, at the polls in the uh, uh, elections for the House of Representatives and the Senate that followed. Uh, that led to a period of revulsion at corruption and a major new set of laws uh, uh, that set, sought to stop the abuses of political corruption that were at the heart of Watergate. By the way, Trump has now sort of eliminated uh, the final residue of many of those laws uh, when it comes in particular to uh, the independence and the perceived need for independence by the Justice Department. He's made it into the most explicitly political arm of the White House with this Attorney General William Barr since uh, since Nixon and, and Watergate uh, and those abuses. So uh, if there were to be a decisive election result this fall in the nature of uh, a, an unequivocal uh, referendum against Trump and Trumpism, yes, I could see, you know, that uh, uh, there would be a real push made to enshrine uh, in law, as well as in tradition, the idea uh, that uh, at the heart of Trump's outrage on the American system was a, a corrupting fundamentally of its processes. But uh, in, in reality, uh, the nature of our divided country right now is, is, is somewhat different and even more hardened than it was in the 1970s. Uh, and I fear uh, that such an unequivocal result with uh, therefore unequivocal follow through is, is, is unlikely. Uh, you, you mentioned the hardened nature of, of politics in the United States. And it does seem like everything is led by identity. How you feel about the COVID crisis, how you feel about uh, George Floyd, it's all uh, identity first. And I don't know if this is necessarily a Washington question. It's definitely a, an American question. How are people thinking seriously about de-escalation? Like how can de-escalation occur? How can you create a political and social cohesion again in the United States? Well, it's a very interesting uh, you know, question. This is obviously a trend that long predates Donald Trump. I should be very, very clear about that. 
you know, this has been happening at the national level for quite a long time in U.S. politics. And in fact, it was Barack Obama and his campaign, his winning campaign in 2008 that had the insight that, uh, you know, American elections were much less now about persuasion uh, of undecided people in the middle and much more about, uh, you know, turnout and uh, 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 motivation and drawing your own people to the polls. And that was the winning strategy that Barack Obama deployed. Now, obviously, uh, his version of motivation is very, very different uh, than Donald Trump's version, version of motivation, but the trends are, are longstanding. In fact, in the 1976 election that followed Watergate, uh, there were something like 24 American states that were up for grabs, that were real mm. battleground states in that election. In other words, half of the United States was genuinely uh, uh, competitive when it came to our political elections. In 2012, uh, which is the, the presidential election right before Donald Trump's, only about 10 states were genuinely competitive. And the actual number was even smaller than that when you looked at, at the results. Uh, and so, you know, we have, uh, over time become more tribal in a way that probably enabled the appearance of someone like a Donald Trump uh, to happen in the first place. But of course, as a politician, uh, he, he is such a natural divider uh, and uh, divisive character that he has exacerbated and hardened those divides. And uh, it's unlikely that uh, any president, even of the modern era, when this uh, was already true, you wouldn't have seen George W. Bush or Barack Obama or Bill Clinton uh, uh, politicizing public health guidance in the way that Donald Trump has in the last few months. Uh, right now, uh, you know, we genuinely have a situation where, uh, you know, the sort of angry white male base that is at the heart of the Trump coalition uh, refuses to wear masks in public to protect themselves and their family and their neighbors because Donald Trump uh, has made it a badge of honor not to do so. And I, I think this might be almost unique uh, in the world. And so, uh, you know, that is something that isn't going to go away just because Donald Trump goes away. And by the way, he will go away at some point, whether it is in this election or in four years. Uh, you know, the question is kind of what what's the residue on American society and American politics as a result of him having been this extraordinary national presence. Um, we, we're starting to get some questions from the audience. I'm going to ask one final question, but while I'm asking and while uh, Susan's answering, please uh, raise your hand or, or write a question we'll, and we'll get to you. My last question is the outro of the book is, is the COVID crisis. It's the very beginning, the very, the eve of the COVID crisis in the United States, late March. And on, I think the second to last page, you, you quote the numbers of deaths in Vietnam, 58,000 uh, American deaths in Vietnam. You know, we're thinking this is that's that's a crazy number. Now we're looking at double that rate this week in the United States of the COVID crisis. Is it going to have uh, an impact on U.S. politics similar to Vietnam? How? What is this as a case study of the way American institutions respond to such a crisis? Well, it does seem uh, for those of us who are too young to you know have uh, been alive or you know missed the 1960s that we're living in some sort of bizarre. Uh, uh, through the looking glass version of the 1960s happening now in American society. Uh, you know, the numbers as I saw them today were something like 115,000 Americans have so far died uh, of COVID-19. And of course, we have no treatment that's effective. We have no vaccine. So that death toll will continue to march on. Uh, and that is more, by the way, not only than Vietnam, it is more than perished in the wars of Vietnam Afghanistan and Iraq combined, it is soon to be more uh, than the number of Americans who died in the Korean War. And uh, it comes again with also now having the largest scale civil unrest in the country since 1968 and the death of Martin Luther King with these recent protests over police brutality and racial injustice in the United States. And uh, a president who seems intent on ripping the country further apart. So yes, of course, I believe there's going to be uh, uh, long-standing uh, ramifications from this. This isn't something where we're just going to like kind of wake up in a fever dream and forget about it. And that's what's interesting. We haven't, I don't even think we've mentioned the name Joe Biden <laughs> uh, so far in this conversation, which by the way, is actually quite reflective of this unique and weird 
uh, presidential election year in the United States where Joe Biden uh, uh, does not figure. And that is good news for him so far. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as the election is a referendum on Donald Trump and his leadership, uh, uh, that is seen as not good news for Donald Trump, who has desperately tried and failed so far to change the subject to Joe Biden. But interestingly, I think Joe Biden has a big challenge for him, uh, uh, not only in defeating Donald Trump, but were he to win, uh, to bring the country back together. He is widely seen as, uh, you know, not really a leader in step with the times. And in fact, his whole appeal has been a certain kind of nostalgia. This isn't the America that I know. He often says, uh, hey world, we'll be back, just hang on for us. In fact, I was at the Munich uh, Security Conference last year uh, in what was sort of the unofficial rollout of the Biden campaign overseas right before he announced his campaign. He gave a speech in Munich. And what did he say? He, the, the tagline was, we'll be back, we'll be back, hang on. Uh, and you know, that's probably not very realistic. And I suspect that even many of those around Joe Biden are quite well aware. Uh, that uh, we don't get to just roll back the clock on history and go back to November 5th, 2016. That world is gone, you know, more or less once and for all. Uh, and it will be a post-Trump world whenever that moment is. That's, that's quite different than, than what preceded it. Yeah. We have a ton of questions. This is great. I think we should take a, a batch of questions to start and then and then go back to you, Susan. So great. we'll take uh, Klaus Wittmann, uh, Lieutenant General Klaus Wittmann, and then Ambassador Kornblum. Uh, and then I'll read one of the written questions and then we'll go back to Susan Glasser. Klaus, you're uh, good, good evening. I'm Klaus Wittmann, a senior fellow at the Aspen Institute, and I am so happy that there are still Americans like you. And I have, <laughs> I have just ordered three... Uh, copies of the book for my two brothers and for myself. And uh, I have three one sentence questions. One, to what extent is Biden's quest to bring decency back to the White House appealing to people? Second, uh, what effect do you ascribe to the criticism of Trump by figures like uh, Matt is in a country where the military is so much respected? And third, I just read Lawrence Douglas's scenarios for the case that uh, Trump would not accept the outcome of the election, which is a very disturbing uh, uh, reading. What do you think? Thank well, you. thank you so much. Oh, we're doing multiple oh, yeah. questions. No, let's get, we'll get a, we'll get a, uh, we'll rack and stack here. Uh, John Kornblum, you're up. Can we unmute? Uh, yep, you're I, unmuted. I unmuted, yes. Thank you very much. Um, for my first question was already asked by Klaus Wittmann. Would, would Trump go so far as to try to torpedo the election in November? It seems that he would, but I'd be very interested in your views. Secondly, however, a totally different subject, but one which is very much on the, everybody's mind. How can Republicans consider it to be in their interest to be trying to kill off Obamacare right now, where so many people in the United States are suffering from lack of insurance. Why we don't have a, a, a regular insurance, uh, national insurance is another issue, but why do the Republicans consider it in their interest to keep on this crusade, which is really not just hopeless, but hateful? Thanks. Thanks, John. And then I'm going to read one uh, question from Noah Barkin, and then we're going to go back to Susan. So Noah Barkin asks, if, if Trump loses in November, uh, what do you expect will happen to him, his enablers, and the Republican Party more broadly? Will, he, will people end up in jail? Uh, will the party remain what it is today, led by a Trumpian successor who spews the same divisive messages? All right. Well, those are nice, easy questions uh, with nice, simple answers. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, especially uh, to Klaus. Uh, you know, if you order three copies, you get to definitely ask three questions. Uh, so <laughs> I appreciate that uh, and, and the thoughtfulness behind them. Uh, you know, first, let me dispense with the, the Trump won't accept the results of the election question uh, in that scenario, because that's one uh, that uh, multiple people have asked here and are increasingly asking and writing about here in the United States. Uh, my thoughts are 
the following. You know, one, we've already seen in a way that's quite disturbing Trump uh, uh, talk about this as a potentially rigged election. By the way, he did the exact same thing in 2016 when he thought he would lose as well. Uh, he uh, uh, sought to raise questions about the election results even before uh, they were final. And then, of course, when he did win, uh, has spent the last several years in outrage that the idea that anyone would question those election results. Um, that being said, uh, you know, the scenario to really fear, of course, is, is the murky outcome. Uh, were he to lose in some clear-cut, definitive way, both the popular vote and the electoral vote, of course, uh, you know, he, he will leave office. I don't have any doubts about that. Uh, you know, we have this bizarre two-tiered system in the United States where we have uh, the uh, direct election, the popular vote, uh, and then we have an electoral college system. And so Trump, like George W. Bush before him, is that rarity a minority president. He's a president who did not win the popular vote, and yet, because of the political geography of our country, was able to win in enough states to prevail in the electoral college. Uh, he has that possibility once again, uh, but there's another more worrisome possibility, which is uh, look at uh, uh, the pandemic and the fact that people will want to be voting uh, from home using mail-in ballots uh, uh, or possibly being forced to stand in long lines, as we saw in Georgia just the other day in a primary election, uh, where systemic efforts to um, restrict voting opportunities for people in largely uh, democratic, largely minority big city areas in the South uh, has been going on for a number of years. So that raises a real worry, uh, which is what if it's so close that we don't actually know who the winner is on the election night itself, but it takes days or even weeks to finally count the ballots. And meanwhile, Trump is fearing that he's behind and is questioning the results of the election, the legitimacy of the election. What if we have a scenario as we did in 2000, where there's a tie, uh, where the courts get involved? That's where I think there's a real worry. Uh, you know, uh, if the Supreme Court, if it goes all the way to that again, and the Supreme Court rules, I do believe that Trump will accept its uh, uh, the legitimacy of whatever their decision is. But of course, he's appointed two justices to the Supreme Court and may feel that he has uh, a strong hand there after very politicized Supreme Court fights in recent years. The Electoral College is required by the Constitution to meet. Uh, uh, the electors meet in the end of December and uh, essentially uh, certify the election. I do believe that if they certify that Donald Trump is the loser, that the Electoral College has done so, uh, that, you know, game over, it's you know, there's no further uh, possibility for him to stay in power. As we've seen from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff today, uh, the U.S. military is not going to be, uh, uh, you know, perpetuating some sort of a coup. You know, the Secret Service uh, is not going to be uh, protecting Donald Trump if uh, the rest of our institutions say that he's no longer president. So I'm not that worried about that. But I am very worried uh, about a sort of too close to call scenario. Um, as for other questions, look, uh, the Republican Party, you asked, uh, uh, Ambassador Cornblum asked about uh, Obamacare and the Republicans. Noah asked about, well, what happens, uh, you know, if Trump loses and the Republican Party. I, I would take those together and uh, say they both fall under the category of, are we dealing with Trumpism? Uh, as a, as a long-term factor in the United States, or are we dealing with Donald Trump as a long-term factor in the United States? And those are slightly different questions. How much have Republicans actually given up their long-stated uh, philosophical and ideological beliefs because Donald Trump doesn't agree with them? Uh, for example, have they all become protectionists? Are they not free traders anymore? Uh, you know, uh, do they love Russia just because Donald Trump seems to have an abiding affection for Vladimir Putin. Uh, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. I think that they are accommodating themselves uh, to the power without fully subscribing to what remains uh, a, a minority ideology, even within the Republican Party, this sort of nationalist, populist uh, uh, ideology with, with very overtly racialist overtones, I should say. Uh, so I imagine, especially if Trump is rebuked, 
uh, at the polls and definitively defeated, uh, that you will have a, a large number of Republicans who are going out of their way to suggest that they never had anything to do with him in the first place and were simply uh, uh, trying to make things less bad. Uh, so, you know, you have a lot of people saying, what, Donald Trump, you know, I, I never had anything to do with him. However, uh, you know, this, say, hardcore 30% or so, um, you know, those people won't disappear uh, simply because Donald Trump is no longer president, uh, just as Richard Nixon, by the way, had hardcore supporters who never really disappeared. Uh, and uh, probably are the grandparents of, of that hardcore 30% that is Donald Trump's biggest supporter. So that faction of the Republican Party will remain an influential faction. Uh, the fight for leadership of them after Trump is already up for grabs. I think that's why you've seen Tom Cotton, the young uh, Arkansas Republican Senator uh, be so aggressive uh, in calling for the military to be used to suppress the riots in America and, that, and the like. So they're gonna be a force for a long time, but they're a minority now of the United States and they will remain uh, a minority. And, and uh, regarding Klaus's question about Biden's quest to bring decency back to the White House, and I think also maybe decency back to Washington. I mean, one of his sales pitches is, I have relationships with people like Mitch McConnell. I can work with these people. They're good people. Is that going to work? Well, my, I suspect he would no longer, uh, and in fact, would be shouted down by his own party were he to say that Mitch McConnell was a good person. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, uh, uh, Joe Biden represents a different kind of politics, a politics uh, where uh, you campaigned uh, in strongly partisan terms, but you tried to govern from the center. You tried to govern by bringing people together. Uh, by the way, that's the Washington that my husband and I wrote about in the Jim Baker biography, which uh, actually has been delayed its publication till September. So maybe we can come back and uh, talk about Jim Baker and German reunification, which was probably his, his biggest success as a leader, but you know what our study of the Baker era, which by the way was also the Joe Biden era in politics, really, you know, the 80s and, and 90s. This is a period when the incentive structure in Washington and the incentive structure in America's national politics was uh, to assemble as broad of a coalition as possible. And that governing uh, was seen as really distinct from campaigning uh, in a way that fundamentally has been just exploded. That distinction, those lines no longer exist anything uh, anymore. Uh, campaigning is governing. And frankly, you know, as I said, Trump doesn't even really have a governing agenda. Uh, he has a, a campaign and a highly political agenda, first and foremost, and almost exclusively. So, you know, Joe Biden wants this to be a referendum on Trump and his leadership, and most of all, on his character and his personal style. And of course, that's actually where Biden gets the strongest marks is um, uh, he is at a moment of health crisis, of national mourning and grieving. You know, he exudes empathy. He has a personal narrative of tragedy. Uh, he, he was a poor man, uh, you know, who spent his whole career uh, in government service. Uh, you know, he, he, uh, is almost the exact opposite of Trump on those issues uh, of fundamental character and decency uh, in a way that certainly would resound to his benefit. So far, that seems to be the major difference politically, by the way, between this campaign and the one in 2016, which is that Donald Trump has not yet succeeded in driving up Joe Biden's unfavorable ratings. And in fact, because Biden has been a public figure for so long, he may have a very, very hard time doing so. Uh, you know, what you see is more or less what you get with Joe Biden. There are serious downsides to that. Uh, uh, he's a very gaff prone politician who has visibly aged in the few years since he has left the vice presidency. But there are obvious upsides as well that stand in stark contrast to Trump. Hillary Clinton, uh, along with Donald Trump, was the most uh, uh, unpopular major party nominee in, in history. And that obviously uh, helps to explain part of the results uh, four years ago. Let's take another round of questions. We have uh, Michael Schuster, then we have Michael uh, Bachfish, and then I'll, t I'll read a question from Dr. Eckhoff. So Mike Schuster, you're up. Yeah, hi, Mike Schuster. I'm a junior member of the Aspen Institute of Germany. 
Uh, let me jump right in. For us Germans, the actions of the American police sometimes seem very strange. <laughs> it can't just be Trump or um, are the problems not deeper? Is it because of the way police officers are trained uh, or is it a social problem? Uh, I'm very interested in your answer. Thank you for this opportunity. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Uh, Michael Backfish, you're up. Can we unmute him? You hear me? Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, Michael Backfish, Funke Media Group, Berlin, Germany. Um, Susan, you said that if Trump wins a second term, there might be a serious fraying of relations with Germany, Uni uh, European Union, and NATO. What does it mean exactly? When uh, Trump started his presidency, he was talking uh, NATO is obsolete. Later, he was backpedaling, saying that the U.S. is committed to Article 5 of the NATO Charter, mainly um, uh, by uh, Vice President Pence. But serious fraying with regard to NATO, does that mean increase the pressure to pay more for defense? Or does it go as far as to leave NATO as Trump wants to leave the World Health Organization? We actually have a very related question from uh, Dr. Eichholz. I'll read it here. It's what can Germany do, I, I, probably in both scenarios, uh, to improve the relationship? Uh, probably working under Merkel's successor as chancellor, she'll have a successor soon. Is it a personal issue too? Can, does Germany have an opportunity either with Biden or with Trump to reset that relationship? So those are great questions and obviously very urgent questions. Um, I, as far as the US-German relationship and US-European relationship goes, I do think uh, some of Trump's animus toward Germany is personal uh, uh, and is focused on Chancellor Merkel. Uh, it didn't help that uh, she has often been juxtaposed with him as the true leader of the free world, uh, you know, in contrast uh, with his much more America-centric uh, uh, withdraw from the world approach to things. Uh, he, uh, but it's also, it, it, I think it's an obsession that by the way, predates uh, Merkel uh, and goes very back very far to Donald Trump, who as you know, is of uh, German origin uh, and yet had a father who was willing to deny his uh, German heritage because he thought it was bad branding in the years uh, after World War II uh, for his real estate business as a landlord. And he told his son that they had to identify themselves uh, as uh, Swedes, even though their, their grandfather had come directly from Germany. Uh, and so, you know, there's this very uh, personal identity based issue for Trump. Trump perceives Germany as a great strength in your Europe and therefore as the great rival of the United States. Uh, he sees things in largely economic uh, market terms and uh, he's been ranting about uh, the success of the German car industry vis-a-vis -vis the American auto industry for literally decades. Uh, people focus on the fact that he was talking about protectionism with regards to Japan uh, in, in the late 1980s, but he was also mentioning Germany uh, in those exact same uh, uh, initial interviews that he gave as a, as a public figure back in the 1980s. So, you know, his animus and obsession with Germany, I think, does predate Chancellor Merkel, but uh, certainly uh, he, he really does not like strong women, I think it's fair to say. And, uh, uh, you know, I can imagine uh, that he will view uh, a new leader of Germany as an opportunity to have a different kind of relationship. But so far, uh, we've seen he has not really bonded with the leaders of, of any of America's traditional democratic allies, whether it's Justin Trudeau uh, or even with Boris Johnson, uh, who seemed to be sort of a soulmate at one point. Uh, you know, Trump really has an affinity for much more authoritarian minded leaders in a way that's striking, uh, whether that is, uh, you know, the leader of Egypt, who he hosted in the White House and uh, called as if it was a great compliment, my favorite dictator, uh, or uh, Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping, who, uh, you know, as you know, he repeatedly praises, even though uh, he has had quite a, a charged relationship overall. With China. So there's the personal politics element with Germany. But then I think there is a substantive issue of what he would do in the second term when it comes to NATO and the European Union. And I would certainly not exclude uh, Trump 
uh, at some point considering pulling out of NATO or blowing it up or reinventing it in some way that was unacceptable to Europeans. And you know, the reason why is that uh, you would be, I think, mistaken to place too much faith in Donald Trump reading words of support for Article 5 after having very publicly been persuaded to do so and forced to do so by the United States um, uh, entire kind of military and political establishment. Um, Donald Trump uh, doesn't change his mind, even if he is not able to pursue his goals at that exact moment. Uh, and I think that uh, you would be wise to consider that commitment to uh, the defense of others to be uh, very, very much at the level of a sentence and a piece of paper that he has read out loud at this moment in time. Mm. Uh, and what about, and obviously this is a big question, but the culture of the pol of police in the United States, is this, uh, obviously police departments have different cultures, but are there trends that we see there? And what is the reform effort that we're seeing uh, being pushed by certain, certain corners? Well, it's a great question. Obviously, it's not my area of expertise, but I think just in terms of what you've seen, as we've all been watching these remarkable scenes, uh, 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 in Berlin, as well as in the United States, uh, in response to the killing of George Floyd. Uh, you know, this is obviously not the first of these incidents, uh, right? So the United States has already had a series of uh, these shocking police killings of uh, young African Americans. And, you know, the filming on video has proved to be, you know, sort of a, a, a galvanizing moment, a political uh, game changer in terms of public perception. And, you know, what we all saw on that horrible video was so manifestly, obviously, and indisputably uh, wrong. It was watching a murder. It was watching a killing uh, in real time. And it was clear to everyone. And by the way, this is something that even in divided America, the polls are not divided on this in a way that I, I think we should all, I suppose, take comfort from uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats saw the same truth in that horrible video, uh, by and large. They saw that it was the killing of an unarmed uh, man uh, in a way that was shocking and uh, there could be no possible justification for. And so I think it was a lack of ambiguity of this incident that seems to have really been the tipping point, that seems to have really uh, galvanized Americans where previous killings upset them, uh, but did not cause quite the same level of social response. Uh, you know, as with all of these social movements, the problem now is our uh, sclerotic uh, uh, political institutions. Uh, let's not forget that uh, we were all shocked and horrified by the massacre of little children at a school uh, uh, in uh, Newtown, Connecticut, a number of years ago during the Obama presidency, the Sandy Hook uh, shooting it's known by. And guess what? It did not result in mass massive national uh, gun control legislation, but quite the opposite. It actually resulted in many Republican controlled state legislatures making it even easier for people to get guns in mm -hmm. the United States. So I would not make the mistake of assuming that just because there is a national and international consensus right now that there will be an easy path to major substantive police reform. We have uh, seven minutes left and we have four excellent questions. So I'm going to go ahead and read these and you can take whichever ones you want or all of them and, and we'll use this as also a final comment. Uh, the first one is from uh, Adriana Antol and she says, could you please explain your metaphor of the DNA of professionals in Washington? The notion of having professionals reduced to DNA uh, is... Uh, of desperate to please the new president seems a little too simplistic. Uh, surely they have expertise and a code of ethics in their DNA. So this is a little bit about the way people are reacting to the president over the past three years. Uh, then we have a question, the next two questions kind of go together. One is from Andrew Michna, and he says, uh, can we stop talking about personalities and talk about the structural questions confronting the nation? And the second is from uh, Thomas Klenabokov, who says the US is going through a period in which the concept of truth uh, is seriously undermined. Uh, from spin to truthiness to open lies to conspiracy theories, uh, how will the country recover from this? How do you rebuild norms and values? Or, or is this just about Trump? So again, those two are kind of related. And the final question, much more specific, but a great one. 
uh, from Marcus Pindor. In Germany, there's discussion among the political left about leaving the NATO nuclear sharing agreement. If this were to happen, uh, what, how would this affect the US-German relationship? And perhaps I'll just tack on there. What, how does it look for new start? Well, that is an ambitious uh, closing five minute agenda. <laughs> Those are terrific uh, questions that are very incisive, I think, and get to the heart of um, the extraordinary moment that we're living in in Washington. And so, I, you know, I would try to tie them together by saying uh, this is an exceptional, in my view, hinge moment of history, sort of a 1989 in reverse, if you will, uh, in which uh, history uh, has come roaring back to the United States. It's no longer uh, something that happens to other people. It's very much something that is happening right now to us. And it's, it's, it's painful and at times terrifying as far as what is revealed about the state of our democracy and the uh, ability of someone uh, who is uh, so not committed to many of the, the norms and traditions of our democracy uh, to blowing through them in a very short period of time is, I think, uh, at heart what we've witnessed. Uh, Donald Trump's war on truth, uh, as Thomas observed, is a, is a signature facet uh, of both his persona and his presidency. And, uh, you know, to those who say, well, why can't we just uh, not focus on his theatrics, uh, his personality, uh, don't pay attention to the tweets, pay attention to the policy. This was something that uh, many wise men, so-called, in Washington said to their friends in Germany and from all over the world when they came uh, to see them in, in an anxious way in early 2017. I know this myself. Uh, you know, I have spoken with uh, these elder statesmen, and uh, they have said the same thing to me. They said, don't pay attention to the tweets. Your media people are simply being distracted by them. Uh, you know, the policy is just fine, we'll be okay. Uh, guess what? These people no longer say that. The, the senior person that I'm thinking of, uh, who I had this conversation with in 2017, uh, who I know for a fact counseled Germans, among others, that they should not pay attention to the tweets, said to me recently, well, the mistake of using impeachment uh, against Donald Trump in the Ukraine matter was simply that uh, they failed to keep it in reserve for the second term when they would surely need it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, the tweets matter. Let's be real. Uh, Donald Trump has exploded uh, and shown how vulnerable the American system of uh, uh, institutions and democracy is to uh, a leader who is not committed fully to them. Uh, and uh, in fact, he just showed it once again. Uh, he tweeted about having uh, uh, the military in the streets to put down the protests, and then he ordered it to be so. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I would say very, very definitively to people that when uh, the leader of a country as powerful as the United States tells you exactly what he is going to do, tells you every single day what's on his mind and what he thinks, that you would be quite foolish, in fact, uh, to simply dismiss that uh, as the politically advantageous rantings uh, of someone and to focus on the bureaucracy uh, and uh, the policy that matters. Because um, in fact, we've shown that Republicans are willing to abandon their long-held policy views uh, in order to bow down before the powerful personality of this particular leader. Uh, and uh, that, it seems to me, uh, is uh, the facet of uh, uh, states that fall into authoritarianism. Uh, and I would think that it would be a particularly uh, resonant and disturbing aspect of the Trump presidency for anyone watching uh, in Germany. Uh, today with its own history uh, in mind. And I do think, by the way, that that's why uh, my friends and my own experience, uh, having been a foreign correspondent covering the former Soviet Union, uh, you know, ha caused me uh, to really take up, uh, take early notice of uh, this aspect, uh, this authoritarian aspect of Trump's personality. Uh, you know, if the leader of the United States calls the press the enemies of the people, uh, as he has done, by the way, since three weeks into his tenure. Uh, he started using this phrase in February of 2017. Well, you know, enemies of the people, vrag naroda in Russian, uh, you know, of course, is, is the very term by which Stalin condemned millions to the gulag. Uh, and uh, Donald Trump has been told this many times uh, at this point and yet continues yeah. to repeat this phrase. Uh, so is it a mere distraction and, and a foolishness uh, that we uh, are 
talking about that or focusing on it? I don't think so. Uh, I think the time uh, for people to understand what's happening in the United States and to reverse course uh, is while they still have the opportunity to do so. We are blessed with a different history uh, 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 than that of Russia, for example. We are blessed with a different history, different traditions, and a different culture. Uh, all of those are being tested by what we're going through right now. So I thank all of you very much for these really insightful questions. I hope you get a chance to read the book. Uh, and I fear that uh, I, but before this is all over, I could fill up many more. <laughs> yeah. So so the first volume, the first volume is Great. here. It's, it's Brief House from Washington. Um, and the book should be available at bookstores or of course online. Um, thank you so much, Susan Glasser. This has been really interesting. Uh, definitely, as you said, trying, and we're at this hinge point. Uh, we definitely want to discuss this and the past hinge point that you you mentioned, uh, 1989, perhaps when your book comes out uh, on James Baker in the fall. But for now, thank you so much, and thank you for everybody for participating. Thank you.